All right, will you open your Bibles with me to John chapter 19? We have been going through just an incredible study of the end of Jesus' life. Talk about end times. We're looking at Jesus' end days on earth at, in a human body, and it's been incredible. It's been an incredible journey. Today, I'm doing something a little bit different. You might go, what is he talking about? But I call today's message, Coming Out. Mm hmm there's a lot of people, nowadays that's a popular topic, coming out. I mean, usually when you hear that, you think of the lesbians or the, or the gays or transgender coming out. I'm, I'm going to let everybody know who I really am. But, you know, I think it's time the Christians come out, okay? I mean, just my own prejudice, okay? I, I just think it's time that Christians, you know, no longer stay undercover, not be embarrassed. And, you know, usually what happens with any kind of coming out is because You've been undercover because you're a little bit afraid of persecution or criticism. It's not popular. Um, and so really, it's perfect time for Christians to come out because it's not popular for Christian, to be a Christian today. It's a little bit wacko. You're a hater, you know? And, and sometimes we give them reasons to think that because there's all kinds of wacko Christians too, huh? And sometimes I'm one of them. Uh, but let's talk today about coming out. And today, by the way, I put a little devotional in your bulletin of five people who came out, out of the closet, out into the open. They went public because of the crucifixion. So when you get a chance, you might want to take a look at that. But right now, we're going to look at two people in particular who came out of hiding, came out of their, their shadows because of the crucifixion. Odd timing. And uh, I, I want to just ask you before we start, what will it take to bring you out in the open? Have you been hiding with your faith? I mean, what, what will it take to make you hide? What will it take to make you sheepish? What will it take to make you go, enough is enough? I've taken all I can stands and I can't stands no more. And you come out and say, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. We're going to look at two people today, but I hope that God speaks personally to you about being forthright about your faith, being a follower of Christ publicly with no shame, whatever the consequences, yes, I am a Christian. Father, we bow before you and we ask that as we look at your word, as we look at the last part of chapter 19 and the crucifixion, the death and the burial, Lord, help us to learn lessons from others who've been there, how they responded. Lord, how should we respond? What should we do because of what we know? Lord, those of us especially who know you as Savior and Lord, help us to be strong and forthright and bold and unashamed. Lord, not obnoxious, but just true followers, true representation of who Jesus is. And so let this text show us and, and shed some light. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, I encourage you to read the other Gospels if you really want to study the crucifixion and the burial and the resurrection because, to be fair, each Gospel writer get, highlights different details. Some Gospel writers might leave out certain facts. Others might bring in things. And, that, and that's why I even put the devotional together because some will leave out the Roman soldiers saying, surely this was the Son of God. So John, I believe, leaves out the, the dialogue between the thieves on the cross. And so uh, to get a full picture, it's good to just read all the Gospels when you're studying an event in Jesus' life. And last time we were together, actually that was two weeks ago, is we are looking at the crucifixion. And sorry, folks, but we left Jesus last week on the cross. His last words, it is finished. Now, I hope that meant a lot to you because that meant paid in full, that the, the, the price for my sins and yours was covered on the cross. Uh, nothing more needs to be done. You can't earn God's love. You can't be good enough. You can't work it off. Jesus paid for your sins on that cross. And, and when, he, when it was all done, just before he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, he said, paid in full. Actually, that's what it meant, to, to telestai. It is finished, translated in English three words, in the Greek one word, which means paid in full. I hope that, that struck a nerve with you and, and you could hold on to that and realize that so many people are trying to just prove their self to God. So many people are trying to gain God's favor when you already have 
his favor in Christ. God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you want to know how much God loves you, you look at the cross. You don't have to go, well, I hope I'm good enough for him. Let's settle that right now. You're not. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm righteous enough. You're not. But he did it all on the cross for you. And now we follow him in faith. Of course, faith and repentance and say, Lord, help me to follow you. But you don't earn your salvation. You don't work it off. He paid for it on the cross. Anyway, am I getting ahead of myself? Maybe. Um, and so the other thing we saw that I didn't talk about as much is Jesus hanging on that cross between those two thieves. Because John doesn't highlight that. And uh, as terrible as this whole situation seemed, it was a fulfillment of prophecy. It was according to God's divine decree. It was all according to plan. And these two thieves were crucified with Christ. Neither of them had any power over their situation. They were nailed to a cross. But somehow one of them, in the midst of his pain, perceived and believed in Christ. Really strange situation, especially, I think God did that on purpose because there's too many people today thinking, can I be forgiven? Well, can God forgive me? Just look at the thief on the cross. There's nothing he could have done to make up for it. He was dying, rightfully being put to death for his sins. And all he did was cry out to Jesus and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him? Assuredly, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Well, first you have to come off that cross and get baptized. No, he didn't get baptized. Well, let me take some time and tell you the four spiritual laws. He never heard the four spiritual laws. He didn't even say the sinner's prayer. He just called out in the name of Jesus. And so here's two criminals, both guilty, both justly condemned. Neither was worthy of forgiveness or grace. Neither was able to do good works or religious acts. Neither could get baptized or say this pat prayer that everyone might not believe me. You know, I want to get you to call on the name of the Lord. And from time to time, I'll lead you in a profession of faith, hoping that others who are right there waiting to cross the line will pray it with us. I, 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 but I just want to be careful for gimmicks. Or misleading people, thinking if you just pray this prayer, everything's going to be fine. If you just cross that line, come up to the front, kneel at the altar, you're saved. Only God knows the heart. But as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel, I want to plead with you, as Paul would say, you know, uh, I, I'm pleading with you to be reconciled with God. But all these guys could do, hanging on the cross, the only thing they could do was relative to the condition of their heart. One heart softened. One heart hardened. You know, pain could do that. Pain could just make you grit your teeth and shake your fist at God and say, why? Heartache, troubles, problems, um, disappointments, tragedies in your life. You could either harden your heart against God or you could say, oh God, I need you. For some reason, one thief hardened, one thief softened his heart. And, and without the four spiritual laws, without reciting the sinner's prayer, uh, one put his faith in Christ because of a changed heart. Both were in a hopeless condition. One was ended up hellbound. The other saved for eternity. Last minute. There's, you know, people talk about deathbed conversions. There you go. I mean, there is such thing. And I, I know I've heard people say, that's not fair. Someone lived evil all their life, and now they just cry out on Jesus, and they're going to heaven. Well, thank God that His grace reaches out to us that you can call out the name of the Lord. Now, the problem is, often, when you're living in sin all your life, your heart gets harder and harder and harder, like that one thief, and you're so hard that there's no reach in you. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, somehow that one thief cried out, and I thank God for deathbed conversions. When I go in a hospital call, and if somebody says, my, my grandfather, my grandmother, my husband or wife, they don't know the Lord. But be careful what you say, because there's people, you know, the, the family's very hostile against the gospel. And I go in there, and the family's all around the bed. I tell them the gospel. I'm not going, well, I'd like to tell you something, but there's people here. I come out. 
I say, let me tell you something. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and if you call upon him right now, even sometimes there's been people in a coma. Sorry, Darren, I'm not following my notes today. There's people in a coma, and I've whispered in their ear and says, right now, call in the name of the Lord. Just say, Jesus, I believe in you. I trust in you. I, I know you died for my sins. I'll do whatever I can up to the last minute because God is a God of grace. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for that. The only difference, the condition of the heart. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes in the righteousness, with the mouth confession is made into salvation. Stop right there. Leave that up. There's some people who will say, no, well, yeah, but you've got to jump through some hoops. What about all the laws and ordinances of the church? All I know is Paul says, if you believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that he raised from the dead and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you can be saved. I love that verse. It's truth, pure, undiluted truth, that there's hope for someone who would just believe in their heart, confess with their mouth, Jesus, and it's that quick. You know, so I guess I, guess I would say that because we meet in a gym. We don't have much time. We just can, we're kind of basic fundamental. Yeah, we just get right down to the Bible and just tell it. It's all about Jesus. You've heard that before, haven't you? And that same grace, by the way, is available to each one of you, okay? Now, I wouldn't recommend you wait to your deathbed because there is always that danger. I believe that the longer you put them off, there's an old song in the, in the Jesus movement, the longer that you put them off, the harder it will get. You harden your heart, you harden your heart, your heart. don't put it off. If God's calling your name, you answer. Don't fight. Don't resist. I, I, I just think that that's a dumb thing to do. Could I say that? I'm not pointing and calling anybody stupid. I'm just saying if you resist God calling you, that, that, that's pretty dumb to me. So the last verse we ended off with, with it is finished in John 19, 30. I hope you found it by now. Gave you plenty of time. And it is finished, paid for in full. Now the Bible says in the next verse, Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So this is just before Passover. We left Jesus last, still on the cross, but he said it is finished, gave up the ghost, he's dead. Now, why would they want to break the legs? Why would they want to take them down from the cross? Because it's a holy day, big deal. Well, according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, that according to the law of Moses, and these were religious Jews, bodies left on the crosses would defile the whole land. Let me just look at it. God says this to the law of Moses. If a man has committed a sin deserving death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain overnight on the tree, but you shall surely bury him that day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged on a tree is a curse of God. Now that's interesting because Jesus took our curse for us, right? And so it's quite appropriate that Jesus would be hanging on that piece of wood because it's, it also speaks of him taking our curse for us. Praise the Lord for that. Now, on the other hand, keep in mind, Roman practice, they were very cruel in this punishment, especially in the crucifixion. Their practice was to leave the victims on those crosses for days, days after the death. Now, by the way, the longest on record that I've heard of, according to history, of, of someone remaining alive on the cross was 13 days. They chose this form of, of punishment because it was so cruel and prolonged. Because you could hang there and not bleed out with the nails in your arms and in your feet, and you're hanging there, and you're, it, it, you're trying to breathe. The, the, the problem is, in most cases, the uh, death from asphyxiation on the cross. Because remember, I showed you that one picture last week where uh, they found a man who was crucified, they found the remains of a man, and his body was actually twisted like this, heels nailed into the cross, bent like this, really, really, I mean, in an uncomfortable position, and hanging on the cross like that. And, and, and you, after a while, you can't breathe. And so they 
push themselves up a little bit to try to gasp for air. And eventually they'd either get so exhausted that they couldn't uh, breathe and they'd die of asphyxiation, or in this case, the Roman soldiers would break the legs to hasten to death so that they'd get it over with. You break the legs, they can't push up anymore and they begin to suffocate and it's just a matter of minutes before the person is dead. So like I said, the actual cause of, of death from crucifixion would be asphyxiation, suffocation. So verse 33 then says, um, I did I read 30? The, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And they did not break his legs, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And immediately blood and water came out. So much to say. You could, there's a whole sermon right here, okay? So much there. Because, I mean, many uh, would say that Jesus actually died of a broken heart. Uh, that that his, his heart ruptured, the pericardium of, of his heart ruptured, and there was blood and water, and it was pierced by the sphere. The, the, the blood rushed out. Now, uh, we know that he didn't just die of a broken heart because he willingly, he was in control all the time. Last week or two weeks ago, we looked at Jesus said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He willingly, he gave, he, he could have stayed alive as long as he wanted. He was always in control. Now, there's two prophecies I want to point out to you that were fulfilled by verse 33 and 34. The first one speaks of the Passover lamb. And, uh, and I, I found many other references after I've already put together this PowerPoint. But several times throughout the Old Testament, we're told, as an example in Exodus 12, that of the Passover lamb, when they would eat that lamb that was sacrificed for their sins, they were not to break any of the bones. And so that would be very interesting. That, that's very appropriate that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Not a bone was broken, okay? There were several other passages, and I, I just, that's all you need for now is that one. Then I, I also found this verse in Psalm. That's quite appropriate. Psalm 34, 19. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. And many would point to this as a picture of what was happening on the cross. So the first prophecy fulfilled was that not a bone was broken. That was promised uh, in prophecy and we were told that the lamb, the Passover lamb was not to have a bone broken. And I can imagine, you know, anybody who really knew what was going on and following the scriptures, watching those Roman soldiers go up to the cross with the mallet and they'd go, Ooh, if they're going to break his bones. If they break his bones, he can't be the Messiah. I mean, but they're going up, oh, I'm, I'm following the, the prophecies of the Messiah. Not a bone of his was broken. And they're going up with the mallet, and it said, he's dead already, so they pierce his side. And then I wonder if someone observing that who knew the scriptures would think of Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, which actually, we only have time to look at this one verse, but the entire chapter 12 speaks of the crucifixion and the end of days. And so you might want to read that for a homework assignment. But in, in Zechariah 12, 10, God says this. He says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. This is God speaking as I read on. Listen, and they will look upon me whom they have pierced. What a, another picture of the deity of Christ. God says they'll look upon me whom they have pierced. If you have any Jewish friends, ask him, so when, look at this verse. When have the Jews looked upon God who they pierced? When have, when have we pierced God? It was on the cross, folks. It goes on to say, yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one who grieves for a firstborn. Also appropriate as a picture of Jesus. And so here's that single phrase, but there's, I tell you, some of the times you look at a verse and you, we're Sunday morning, we're only doing one message on this topic. If, if, you, if you like what you see, write it down and go back and do your homework. Read the whole chapter. So many of these prophecies, you want to read the whole chapter to get the great, the full messianic picture. <coughs> Another thing I found interesting, and, and I told you I like to collect study Bibles, the first century study Bible, which is written uh, from a Messianic Jewish perspective of, of uh, the Gospels, 
the uh, first century study Bible, speaking of the blood and water that came out when the soldier pierced his side, says this. According to the Mishnah, the Passover lamb was slaughtered in, a very, in very specific ways. After the priest had killed the lamb, he slit the heart and let out its blood. So that was a practice in Jesus' day that after the Passover lamb was put to death, they would then slit the heart and let out the blood. Again, so appropriate that the same thing would happen to Jesus. Verse 35 goes on to say, then, as, And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you might believe. Now, who's writing that? It's John. Jo John was an eyewitness of the crucifixion. As a matter of fact, if you back up to verse 25 through 27, you see John was there with uh, some of the women, uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and other few other women, and John, and you wonder, where, the, where were the rest of the apostles at this time? Uh, I can only guess, I can't prove to you that any of the other ones were actually there but John. Yeah, Luke, uh, who wasn't an apostle, the doctor who later wrote the account and says, I've taken careful I've, I've taken great care to get all the facts and write this gospel, O oh, oh, most excellent Theophilus. He was writing to someone to tell them the gospel, and he did all the homework and interviewed all the people. Matthew, he was, he was one of the disciples, but I don't know if he was there. Mark, he wrote the gospel, to, uh, his own gospel. But John was the only one that actually says, I'm an eyewitness of this. And it's the same John who later, and we went through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John some time back. It's the same John who said this in 1st John chapter 1, the one who existed from the beginning, speaking of Jesus, is the one we've heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes, touched him with our own hands. He is, this, he is Jesus Christ, the word of life. This one who is life, from God was shown to us, and we've seen him. And now we testify and announce to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was shown to us, and we're telling you about what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, that you might have fellowship with us. I love First John. That's why we took some time to go through it, because John is saying, man, I'm not just telling you something I heard from somebody else. I lived with him. I touched him. I embraced him. I put my head on his bosom. I'm the one who Jesus loved. That's the way John called himself. He says that our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy might be complete. Now, notice he doesn't just say for your joy. He says, our, I'm writing these things so our joy will be complete. Can I just squeeze this in here? I think you could find more complete joy as a Christian by telling others about Jesus. I think that, that's what John's saying. John said, I got to get this off my chest. If I just bottle it up, I'm going to blow up. I, I got to tell somebody. And when I tell somebody, it makes me happy. I mean, it, it makes, it, it really gives you joy. I could tell you, probably the greatest joys I've had in life was sharing the truth of the gospel with others and watching the light go on. Now, on the other hand, there's times when I share the gospel and they reject it. I had one of those times last, yesterday. yesterday. We went out door to door. I, I'm an emotional kind of guy. And, and when you have too many people go, I don't want it, man, go away. And, mm, eh. and <coughs> after a while, I just, <coughs> excuse me, I'm all, getting all choked up. <coughs> it does affect me. Just like on the other hand, when I see somebody hunger and thirst for righteousness and I share the gospel, I remember times sharing the gospel with somebody and they're just going, yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that. What, what do I do? I want to follow Jesus. And you're just going, oh my gosh, you get goosebumps. There's nothing greater. Oh, I'm going on another spirit gust, okay? We don't have rabbit trails here. Get spirit gust, okay? And, and so I just want you to know, if you're lacking joy in your Christian life, find a way to share the gospel with somebody. Because if you just make it all about you, it makes it a pretty small package, you know? I want to be happy. How come I'm not happy? What are they doing for me? What are you doing for me? How come I'm not getting there? How come I'm me? That's a quick way to get depressed, right? But when you tell people about him, I'm telling you, just this, I'm just sneaking this one for free, okay? That, that 
you will find more joy in living as a Christian if you find a way to share your faith with others. There are those times you get rejected and then the joy isn't so much. But I think it's worth it all for the times when it works. And John is saying here, I, it just brings me joy to share this with you. And it's the same John that at the end of this very gospel, he says this in chapter 20. These things, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So keep in mind, everything we've read about so far and everything we continue to read about in the Gospel of John, it's so that you might believe and have life. He's not trying to put, you know, some people look at the Bible as a big bummer. Oh, I've heard people say, oh, the Bible is written by men to control people. Just telling you what you can and can't do, control you. Yeah, they want to control you like thou shalt not kill. Now you can't, now we can't kill, you know. Thou shalt not lie. Oh, you're just trying to control me. I want to lie. Get over it, okay? The gospel was written, the gospel, I mean, there's all parts of the Bible, but the gospel was written that you might believe in Jesus Christ and because of your faith in him, have life and life abundant. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 10. I've come that you might have life and that more abundant. The thief came to steal and kill and destroy, but I came, you could really live, okay? Now, by the way, that's, I'm getting off spirit, Gus. That, that, that's one of the reasons I'm a Christian, because I want the most I can get out of life. I really do. I want to really live. People go, well, I don't want to give up my life of sin because it's so fun. It's killing you. It's destroying you. It's corrupting you from the inside out, and you're always looking over your shoulder. You're either going to get caught by the law or caught by your spouse or caught by some. It's like, I love guilt-free living. I love to have a clear conscience, walk before the Lord, be in the center of his will, walk in the spirit, and experience his presence in my life. And it all comes through faith in Christ and having that abundant life. Okay? Moving right along here. Okay. Verse 38. I have to look at those two prophecies. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, here's those guys that are coming out, okay? Asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and he took the body of Jesus, and then Nicodemus, another secret disciple, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pounds, which by the way, the hundred pounds, that troubled me because I like to read the text in a lot of different translations. New American Standard, uh, the King James and the New King James are the only Bibles that say 100 pounds. The others say 75 pounds. And if you want to see there's contradictions or, or, or things in the Bible that, that might you, you have trouble over, well, it's silly things like this, okay? Oh, no, I can't, I can't trust the Bible because one Bible says 100 pounds of, of myrrh and aloes and another says 75. I, I haven't found the exact solution Go to Matt, he'll tell you the solution to that one. But I don't know the, the solution to that one. I know that some Bibles I really rely upon, New American Standard, New King James, and King James say 100 pounds. The others, some of your other modern translations say 75. If you want to find problems with the Bible, this is the best you're going to find. If you're looking to attack and criticize the Bible for errors, this is the best you're going to come up with. And it's no big deal, okay? Either way, it's enough burial ointment for a king. 7,500 pounds? I mean, they didn't do this for the average Jew. And so here's two rich men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, bringing aloes and myrrh. And these were all like um, perfume-type ointments to cover up the smell of a de decaying body. It was customary for royalty to do something like this. And that's how they, that's how they treated the body of Jesus. It says in verse 40, they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, we could go too deep in this because I've, I've heard and read a lot of stuff about the different customs and how they changed through the years. We'll just leave it at that. that this is the way at the time of Christ, the custom of burial. Now, let me talk about these two men who were coming out a little bit. I wrote something so I don't miss, mess it up. Let me read you a little bit about Joseph of Arimathea and then Nicodemus. Joseph of Arimathea was a courageous man 
who was waiting for the kingdom of God, according to Luke chapter 23, verse 50 and 51. He was a wealthy man, according to Matthew chapter 27, 57. He was an influential leader in Jerusalem and a member of the high council, the Sanhedrin, according to Mark 15, 43. He also disagreed with the decision to kill Jesus. And, and so he, you know, there were some who spoke up and says he shouldn't die. But after the death, he asked Pilate for a favor of burying Jesus in his own personal tomb. It doesn't say his own personal tomb in John, but you could read about that in, uh, well, yeah, well, where could you read it? In, in Mark. Actually, I have all the, all the listing in your bulletin when I wrote about him. So Joseph was also a secret disciple, but his bold deed, this brought him out in the open, out in the public, um, at the crucifixion. Now, let me tell you something that, that I'm thinking. I don't know if you're thinking when you're watching this. Why come out now? It almost seems too late. What, what does Nicodemus and Joseph have to gain from coming out into the open now? I mean, it's too late. He's dead. Did they know something? They didn't know about the resurrection, did they? Nicodemus, for instance, a religious leader who came to Jesus a couple times, John chapter 3 and John chapter 7, secretly by night in John chapter 3, he was also a member of the Sanhedrin, the high ruling council of the Jews. And he understood that these bodies had to be buried before the Sabbath because of what I just told you about the law of Moses. And then his public support, along with Joseph of Arimathea, might indicate that Nicodemus was also a secret disciple. So they bring myrrh, commonly used for the, the uh, aromatic powder, aloes, a fragrant powder of sandalwood that, that kind of covered up that, that smell. And they went from secret believers to, why now? And I, I can't help thinking for you and me, what does it take to bring us out in the open? You know, I heard stories, and I, I heard stories that when ISIS, and, and the, ISIS is still doing dastardly deeds, folks, if you're keeping up with the news. But I had heard stories that when they took all those men on the beach and began to behead the Christians, that some who were watching came out and said, I'm a Christian too. Who had been undercover, secret believers, but they saw the faith of these men, the courage of these men, and they came out and says, I'm a Christian too. Isn't that strange? You would think now's the time to go, mm, I'll think, let me pray about it, you know. But, but in the midst of a tragedy, these men were so moved that they came out of the closet and they went public at a time when it would cost them everything. And I think similarly, these two men, it was going to cost them everything. Matter of fact, the tradition, church tradition tells us that both of these men were ruined in the Jewish culture because uh, they lost their great wealth, they lost their position because of standing up, coming out of the closet for Jesus at this time. And, and also keep in mind, according to Jewish the law of Moses, if you touched a dead body, you, you were unclean for a number of days, and doing what they're doing right now, taking the body of Jesus and preparing it for burial, would disqualify them for participating in the Passover. And so I can't help wondering, did they somehow realize this is the Lamb of God who took away the sins, takes away the sins of the world. This is the Passover. And I no longer have to worry about practicing that other Passover because this is it right here. And I'm going to give my everything for the Lamb of God. You think they had nothing to gain and everything to lose. Uh, they didn't know about the resurrection. They lost the ability to participate in the Passover. And, and somehow I just think that this is real, a sign of real faith. They really believed. I think sometimes that's the only time you really know when somebody believes. When the, <clears throat> when the rubber meets the road, you know? When it's going to cost you. I mean, anybody can say, oh, I'm a Christian. And all of a sudden when, when there's persecution, uh, I'm not a Christian. But this is, how, you know, this, and I think someday, I think someday we each get tested. I really do. I've worked it over and over in my mind as the persecution in America is rising. I know it ebbs and flows. There's times right now they want to see which candidate is really Christian. I mean, I mean there's all kinds of political things that go on. Uh, but it's possible that someday in my lifetime, 
it, it could cost me everything to profess to be a follower of Christ. And I've worked it over my mind, and I rehearse it, and I play it. And what if I was in some of these other countries where ISIS came in? Would I cowl down, or would I say, here it is, here's the dotted line. I drew it in for you, you know? And, and I pray and hope that I would stand the test, and, and I would have, as they call dying grace, grace to face that moment. And I think you need to think about it, too. Oh, maybe, maybe not lose your head, but maybe lose your job? Huh? There's, have you read the news? There's people losing their job over it. Maybe be sued because you won't do certain things that go against your faith. Will you stand for your faith? Where will you draw the line? You need to think about it. Pastor Mike, I came to church to feel good. Now you're ruining my Sunday, and could you get to something happier? No. I mean, this is where we're at right now, okay? And, and, and I think this is real life. And I think this is what the Lord wants us to ponder, is what kind of Christian am I? Am I undercover? Am I in the dark? What will it take to bring me into the light? And praise the Lord, these two men came out. Now, again, I'll remind you, read the, the shepherd of sheep, and I wrote about five. I won't do a spoiler. Well, yes, I will. One of them's you. Okay. They're going public, and we need, to, we need to relate to that as well. Verse 41, which we're almost finished. We're really moving along quickly here. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Now, verse 40, so there was, uh, excuse me, so there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Now, like I told you, um, Oh, it's in Matthew chapter 27, where we could read about, it's actually Joseph of Arimathea, his own personal tomb. And I've heard uh, from others that if he was from Arimathea, certainly culture in that day, and a rich man from Arimathea, there would have to be a family tomb in Arimathea, because that's tradition, that's custom, that you're buried with your family. But this man, a faithful Jew, a faithful man, moved to Jerusalem, and now he's, he's chewing a new tomb in the rock in Jerusalem. That says something about who he is, because it was, it was the goal for every faithful Jew. I want to be right where it starts when the resurrection takes place. I want to be right there in the heart of Jerusalem, and, and, and the most that every faithful Jew could hope for is they want to be buried as close to Jerusalem as possible, because their belief is that the, the, when the Messiah comes and the resurrection starts, they want to be the first wave, you know, and that, that's just one of the customs, one of the practices. So here's Joseph, he actually is, has a new tomb, and from my understanding, it wasn't completed yet. Matter of fact, I've been to the garden tomb. I'm going to show you some pictures in a moment. Uh, that it looks like a very rich man, because you don't just carve a, a tomb out of solid rock unless you have some means, you know, some wealth to be able to do that. But began to... to carve or have some, you know, hire people to carve this stone. Let me show you a couple pictures here. First, I'm going to show you a picture of a rolling stone. I'm not talking about the magazine, I'm not talking about the band, okay? Uh, this is a rolling stone tomb, and I've seen several, when I've gone to Israel, they're all over Israel. Sometimes you could be at a bus ride, and you're driving along a highway, and the bus slows down a little bit, and you'll see a bunch of holes with rolling stones in front of it, because uh, there are common ways to bury people of different status. <clears throat> and I'm going to explain to you in a moment uh, the, um, the status that I believe that Joseph of Ar Arimathea's tomb was. But the Gordon's Calvary is another place that we've been to. Let's look at the next slide there. This is the place where many, many people believe was the actual tomb of Jesus. And it's called Gordon's Calvary. And there's so much we could get into explaining why they believe this is the actual uh, tomb. My concern, I was in there a couple times. My concern is, <clears throat> I've been to Israel, and I've seen places where they go, this is where, this is where Jesus prayed in, in sweat drops of blood. And then they have to build an iron fence around it, and people are reaching through to touch it, and they want to kiss it. And then the same thing happens with anything that you say, Jesus was there. For me personally, folks, I just think Jesus was there. Jesus is here, Okay. I'm good with that. <clears throat> you see where Jesus once knelt? Maybe, maybe not. 
You see the tomb, Gordon's Calvary? Maybe, high possibility, maybe not. But either way, Jesus is here. That's what really matters. Is Jesus here living in you? Is Christ in you unless you fail the test, what 2 Corinthians says. So that's the most important thing. Make sure Jesus is within you. Because people, people get weird on this. They go to Israel and they weep and they want to get baptized in the Jordan. And I've baptized people in the Jordan. It's kind of neat. But, but I realize what really matters is where is Jesus now? He's risen. Well, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, right? But he is. He's risen and he's no longer, you know, he, you go to Israel and there's actually almost two or three churches for every event that Jesus did. Oh, this is the Garden of Gethsemane, and there's a church there. No, this is the Garden. There's a church there. This is where Jesus ascended, the, the, the Church of the Ascension. This is on the top of Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus ascended from this place here, and, and uh, they got a church there. But there's three of them, okay? It's confusing, and really, it doesn't matter. You know, some of the places they even have, there's a footprint. That's where he took off from. Where did he go? <laughs> He left all, so get, get, stop it. I mean, I believe it's all historically true, but people will always want to know, we have the church built upon the actual spot. You know what? The church is the people, and Christ is in the people, and that's what matters. That's why we can meet in a stinking gym and still worship the living God. It doesn't matter. We don't need to get weird about it, okay? Another spirit guest. Okay, listen. What I want to show you right now is inside the typical tomb, particularly a rich person's tomb, it's the third slide. Uh, this is what they would normally do. I, mean, I got a copy of it so I could describe it, but I'll turn around looking. Uh, and typically, you see the different uh, niches where they would actually put bodies in these different niches. And typically, they would put these bodies there until they decayed. And then they, later, they'd have somebody come and gather up the bones and put them in an ossuary box. And in some of the, these family tombs, you could go and you see these little ossuary boxes. These little, they're about this big. And they're stone boxes where all those, the bones were placed after the decay of the body. And that was the practice of the Jews. Of course, we don't do it like that now. <clears throat> so this is a typical uh, rich person's Jew, uh, Jew, rich person's tomb in Jesus' day. And of course, you see the, that rolling stone that you move that rock, and the stone rolls over, and it seals, uh, <clears throat> it seals the um, the tomb. Now, what I want to look at is the garden tomb. And now, I couldn't find a really good illustration except for this little black and white one, but it, it, it's accurate. I've been in there. See the door? You go in the door and directly in front of you when you go in the door is a bench for the preparation of the body. They would put the body there and work on the body, wrap the body, put the ointment and the myrrh and the aloes. They would work on that body there and then they'd go through that next door on the right and that's where they would lay the bodies until after the decay and then put them in an ossuary box, okay? Of course, Jesus never got to that point. You know the story, right? And this, the illustration, the reason I picked this one is I want you to see this is what the garden tomb looks like. <clears throat> it actually looks like an unfinished tomb that it was maybe originally carved for a big family. And it, when Jesus was buried there, nobody had ever been laid there before. And it would be quite appropriate that after the resurrection, they would kind of like, I'm not putting anybody in there. That's a special place. And so uh, uh, that was it. Yeah, that, that's the garden. That's the illustration of the garden tomb. One more thing I want to go over with you before we wrap things up is a map that I found that to be very helpful of the travels of Jesus in the last 24 hours. You see, number one says the Garden of Gethsemane, where he prayed and he was arrested. We've been through all this in our study of the Gospel of John. The the mob paraded him uh, past the Ontario. Uh, uh, Antonio Fortress, and uh, he went to the place of Herod, uh, actually, first of all, number two, the high priest, and then he went back and forth a couple times between Herod and Pilate. They were playing their little games with him. Eventually, he was found guilty, and he was marched off number six over there to Golgotha, and, and I, you know, I guess I should have found a picture for you because it is, when they say the place of the skull, you can look across and see this it's probably greatly eroded since Jesus' day or even since Abraham's day, which that's where Abraham reportedly also 
was ready to sacrifice Isaac, remember the story. I'll bet you it looked a whole lot more like a skull because it's a bit eroded. I should have got that for you. Maybe I'll get it for you in the future. Where you could look and you could see. You could see it looks like the place of the skull. And it was called Calvary. And so uh, one of the reasons why we're called Calvary Chapel is we want to remember the most important event, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, I thought it would be incomplete without finding the tomb, but I couldn't find a map that had it all on there with the tomb. But if you look up on the upper right hand, just above the Golgotha, is a, around there was the actual tomb, and that's where the garden tomb is. I got it up there? It's where I have, a, I have a red X up there, so you can look at it. So the last 24 hours of Jesus, I don't know, I want to show you pictures because all my years of, of going to Bible study and hearing preachers, I, I need pictures. Are you like that? I, li I even like the picture Bible, okay? I need pictures because you could read to me over and over again. I'm just going, oh, blah, 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 blah. you know, it's like I don't get it. Show me a picture. I go, oh, why didn't you just show me that in the first place? So I figured I'd help you guys. with. If you have my disability, you understand you need pictures, okay? So Joseph of Arimathea gave up his own family tomb for a dead Savior. And little did he know that about three days later, history would be changed forever. And history would be made, and the world would never be the same. And I'm looking forward to next week when we break into chapter 20 and we look at the details of the resurrection. Because people say, what's the greatest thing that Jesus ever did? And I certainly believe dying on the cross for our sins was so, so important. But if he didn't raise from the dead, I think that would have been a problem. Because the resurrection will show us that his sacrifice was accepted before God. And not only was it accepted, but he was everything he claimed to be because he was able to overcome death, rise from the dead, ascend into heaven and say, I'm coming back just the way I left. I'm coming back the same way. Keep looking up. I'm going to return. And so I think that without the resurrection, we have an incomplete picture. So stay tuned. Be with us next week. But for now, let me just close with this. Have you come out? Have you gone public for Jesus? Now, I am not. I was wrestling over this. You know, this is a great place to get people to come forward. You know, you could come forward here and then stay hidden out there. I'm going to challenge you that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you find a way this coming week to come out. Let somebody know who you've been kind of, well, I didn't want to really mention, well, I'm afraid what you might think. Well, I'm, you, know, you need to be... be courageous, be a, a man or woman of faith, and, and not be ashamed. Maybe let's put it that way. Don't be ashamed to call yourself a follower of Christ. Disclaimer, I admit there's a lot of obnoxious people out there who call themselves Christians and you wish they wouldn't tell anybody, okay? But let's at least let people know there's some of us who um, love Jesus and I'm not ashamed of it and I'm not out condemning everybody and, and, and you know, I'm not a hater. I, I love the Lord and I love you. Matter of fact, on our door hanger that we go out, we put on doors and we give to people, it says God loves you and because God loves you, we love you. That's what a Christian is. It's somebody who loves others. Well, let's put it this way. It's somebody who has faith in Christ and is born again. But what, what shows most how we know that you're a Christian, you, you will be, you, they'll know you're my disciples because of your love, one for another. And so when you know that God loves somebody, how could you not love them too? All right? Let me just read this final verse and then we're dismissed. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Jesus said this. He says, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, I've seen this verse used as almost manipulation for an altar call. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to send you out and tell you to come out, tell the world. Find a way. Lord, help me to find a way to share my faith with the people I work with, with my relatives, with my neighbors, people who maybe I was afraid what they would think, but I'm, I'm tired of being ashamed of being a follower of Christ. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, don't come out. I mean, don't tell somebody you're a Christian if you're not. I'm not saying don't become a follower. Yes, absolutely. But we got too many phonies out there coming up. We got too many hypocrites. We got too many people who, you call that a Christian? 
go back in, you know. So my challenge for you this week is say, Lord, show me. Show me how I can come out with my faith. There are so many people coming out for so many other things. And in my opinion, people are coming out for things they should be, they should be ashamed of. But you shouldn't be ashamed of Christ. You should come out and show forth your faith. And proclaim Christ to your neighbors, your friends, uh, your co-workers. All in a timely way, all in an appropriate way, but don't be ashamed.